Hello and welcome to Vodcast 13.2. In this Vodcast, I will overview the three primary factors that affect wind. Before discussing the factors that affect wind, I'll start off by defining wind. Wind is the horizontal movement of air. Winds will always move out from high pressure areas and into low pressure areas. On weather maps, the highs will be represented with a blue H and the lows will be represented with a red L. Now this is a very important point. The ultimate energy source for most wind is incoming solar energy. And it's the unequal heating of Earth's surface that creates the high pressure and the low pressure zones that ultimately cause that movement of air. So make sure you keep that in mind. The sun drives so many processes on Earth, and the wind is one of them. Now let's talk about the three controls of wind, the first of which is the pressure gradient force. The pressure gradient force is the force that results from a difference in atmospheric pressure between two locations. On the pressure map that you see on the right side of this slide, the lines separating areas of different air pressures are called isobars. And if we focus in on this particular section, which takes us from Chicago to central Illinois, right around where Decatur's at, we see that since both locations fall between the same isobars, they will be experiencing equal air pressures. Now there are two very important things I need to stress on this slide, and the first is the pressure gradient. The pressure gradient is the pressure change over distance. And the horizontal pressure gradient is the driving force of wind. We're going to discuss three factors that affect wind, but pressure gradient is the most essential one. Now when we look at a weather map, when you see closely spaced isobars, that indicates strong wind speeds. In other words, there is a steep pressure gradient where the isobars are very close together. However, when you see very widely spaced isobars, we're talking about light winds or calm conditions. And where those isobars are widely spaced, we would have a weak pressure gradient. I'd like to talk about some of the features of this image, because you'll probably see images like this on quizzes and tests. Let's start off by focusing in on the low pressure center, which is located in western Indiana. Winds want to flow from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure, and the lowest pressure on this map is where you see that red L. In other words, winds want to flow to the L and away from the H. Now notice how closely all the isobars are spaced near that red L. That indicates a very steep pressure gradient, and we should expect to see very high wind speeds in areas around that L. But one other important thing to note is that the winds don't cross the isobars in a perpendicular fashion. You might expect that if wind flows from areas of high pressure to low pressure, but one of the other things we'll talk about in this vodcast is the Coriolis effect. And the Coriolis effect will deflect winds to the right in the northern hemisphere. The wind direction can be determined by knowing that the wind is always towards the station circle. So for the northern Illinois location, the winds are coming out of the northwest. One other thing I'd like to stress is the high pressure zone, which can be found in Canada. Now unlike the low pressure zone, where the winds are coming towards the low pressure area, the winds come out of the high pressure area. So instead of seeing converging winds as you'd see in the low pressure area, you see diverging winds in the high pressure area. The wind speeds you see around the high pressure zone are relatively weak compared to the wind speeds you see near the low pressure zone. And again, the spacing of the isobars is our evidence for that fact. I'd like to take a quantitative look at the pressure gradient for us just to help you really understand what's going on with this concept. In the image on the left, I'm going to put a line segment in that represents 50 kilometers. Now if I put that line segment in the region where there's a strong pressure gradient for us, you can see that it can't fit very many 50 kilometer line segments in this region. So there's a pressure drop from 1,000 millibars to 996 millibars over a relatively short distance. That indicates a strong pressure gradient force, and that means that we would see strong winds in this region. Now let me take my same line segment into a region where there's a relatively weak pressure gradient force. I can now fit multiple line segments in this region, and what this indicates is the 4 millibar drop in pressure occurs over a much greater distance than it did near the low pressure zone that we previously overviewed. So just to say it once more, when the isobars are spaced very close together, we have a strong pressure gradient force, and the winds will be strong in those areas. And when there's wide spacing between our isobars, there will be a weak pressure gradient force, and the wind speeds will be weak. Now take a look at the map you see on the right side of this slide. The question is, will location B or D have stronger winds? The answer to this question is location D. And generally speaking, the winds will be stronger near lows than they will near highs. The isobars are spaced very, very close together near location D, 
and in location B, the isobars are spaced much wider apart. So when you see wide spacings, we're talking about a weak pressure gradient force, and when you see very narrow spacings, we're talking about a strong pressure gradient force. There's two other important factors I like to discuss that affect wind. The second is the Coriolis effect, which is the deflective force of Earth's rotation on all free-moving objects, including the atmosphere. Now to understand the Coriolis effect, let's pretend that we're standing at the North Pole and we're going to launch a rocket towards the equator at the target shown in the image. If Earth didn't rotate, we would launch our rocket and it would hit the target perfectly. However, that's not what happens on a rotating Earth. Let's suppose our rocket takes exactly one hour to go from the North Pole to the equator. We launched the rocket at 12 o'clock noon, so we expect it to get to the equator at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Well, as that rocket is traveling in the air, planet Earth is rotating underneath the rocket. In fact, in one hour, Earth will rotate about 15 degrees. Now, somebody watching this from outer space would see our missile traveling a straight line path. But for us here on Earth, we would see an apparent deflection, and our rocket would end up missing the target quite a bit to the right. That path deflection is due entirely to the Coriolis effect. Now in the example I just presented, we are talking about launching rockets, but the Coriolis effect has the exact same effect on winds. In the northern hemisphere, the deflection will be to the right, just as it was for our theoretical rocket launch, and in the southern hemisphere, the deflection will be to the left. Now it's very important that I state that the Coriolis effect will only affect wind direction. It has no effect on wind speed. The third and final factor that affects the wind is friction, and friction will always oppose motion. Now what that means is friction will act to slow down the movement of air. Now it's also important to note that if friction slows down winds, it will also weaken the Coriolis effect. Because faster moving air will experience more deflection due to the Coriolis effect than slower moving air. So if friction slows air down, it also diminishes the Coriolis effect. And I'd like to show you this image just to kind of tie everything together. In the upper atmosphere, friction is negligible, so the frictional force will have no effect on winds high up in our atmosphere. But near Earth's surface, friction does have an effect. The pressure gradient force is the red arrow you see on this image, and it will always point in the direction of the lower pressure region. Now, in a perfect world, the Coriolis force wants to be at a right angle to the pressure gradient force. And remember, the Coriolis effect wants to deflect the wind to the right in the northern hemisphere, which is why in image B, you see the Coriolis effect arrow to the right of the red arrow. What's interesting is, if there were no frictional forces, the winds would actually flow parallel to the isobars because the only two things that would be working would be the pressure gradient force and the Coriolis effect. But near Earth's surface, we have the pressure gradient force, the Coriolis effect, and then we have friction opposing the motion of wind. That friction arrow is in the exact opposite direction of the wind, meaning that it is slowing the wind speed down, the pressure gradient force vector will always point towards the low pressure area, and the Coriolis effect arrow will always point to deflect the wind to the right in the northern hemisphere. And that also explains why the winds don't cross the isobars in perpendicular fashion. The Coriolis effect is responsible for making the winds cross those isobars at an angle. Okay, that concludes this video podcast. In our next podcast, I will go into much greater detail on high pressure centers and low pressure centers, also known as highs and lows.